Hi everybody, my name is Nathaniel and welcome to Grab It Magazine. We are your source for the best in indie gaming news and content. Today we are focusing on early access games. The list of games that you can buy into early is always growing. However, it can be hard sometimes to tell the difference between a game that is great now and one that could be great in a little while. So with that in mind, we have put together this list of games that are great fun to play now and are only getting better. Enjoy. The first game on our list of must-play indie early access titles is Crawl. Now, Crawl is one of those games that's best played with friends on a couch over pizza and drinks. It's one of those games that forces each player to be hyper-competitive and strive to one-up everyone else who's playing. As you can see, it's styled like an old-school arcade game. It's all very sort of classic Natari and Nintendo. And even the music and sound design are all outstandingly retro. Crawl is made by a two-man team from Melbourne, and it's been funded by the Screen Australia Games Funding. Crawl feels like something that you would find in an arcade decades ago, but that being said, the modern design sensibilities shine through the classical styling. Crawl follows the current trend of all versus one gameplay, like the upcoming Evolve or Shadow Realms, but it does so with a twist. It's an old-school dungeon crawler that takes place over a series of rooms, with different floors and enemies, mini-bosses, and then the great evil beast at the end. However, the game takes four players at a time, one of whom gets to be the mighty hero. The rest are all lost souls, who are able to inhabit the traps and enemies that spawn in the environment. Now the big twist comes when one of these lost souls manages to kill the hero. They regain their humanity, and are able to take his place and continue the quest. Each player has their own hero level, which only goes up when they are the hero. Otherwise, they are gaining Vitae points, which are used to level up their monsters at the end of each floor. Now, the boss can be challenged by any of the heroes who are above level 10, but this isn't an easy fight, as it's also 3 against 1, so each hero has to do a balancing act, deciding whether to challenge the boss now, or try and gain a few extra levels, knowing of course that the other players are getting stronger at the same time. So, Crawl pushes this feeling of uncertainty, where the monsters want the hero dead, but of course you want to be the one to lay the final blow. But as the hero, you want to get to the end, defeat the boss, with everybody trying to stop you and do it themselves. Into the future, the devs plan to add more levels, more monsters, more bosses, and just more of the game that's already here. Which can only be a good thing. Crawl toes the line between competitive and cooperative gameplay, and as such, it's definitely worth a look. Especially if you've got friends around to play with. Though, the AI opponents do provide a good challenge. Hand of Fate is the game on this list that probably has the most unique concept. It's a clever mix of sort of a tabletop adventure game, a deck building game, and an action RPG. With little bits of choose your own adventure thrown in for good measure. This one is for the RPG fans out there who like a challenge. The player is an adventurer, and you find yourself playing a game of cards against the dealer. He's an enigmatic character who is both ally and enemy, as he defines the challenges of the game. The dealer lays out cards from the deck face down on the table, and these cards make up the game board for your adventure. As you land on each card, it gets turned over and you deal with the challenge on the other side. These challenges could be treasure, rock falls, banded ambushes, they're all sort of pretty standard RPG fare. But it's the way that the game showcases these adventures that really sets it apart. If you land on a combat encounter, you get thrown down into a 3D arena, and you have to fight your opponent in Arkham Asylum style combat. It's all very responsive and swift, all about timing and dodges and proper abilities. The enemies, however, are always different, as they too are chosen by the cards. So a 3 of dust is 3 bandits, a 6 of skulls is 6 skeletons. At times you get to decide which cards you want to fight out of a choice of 3 but the dealer can always overrule your choice and make you fight the other two cards together. The metagame is where a lot of the tactics and deck building elements come into play. Most encounters are going to reward you with loot, such as swords, shields, armor, and abilities, and sometimes tokens. At the end of each run, these tokens get turned into cards that you can add to your deck. This deck is a set of cards that gets mixed into your next playthrough, so if you want, you can stack it with weapons or gold cards or if you find that you're particularly good at the Maze of Traps card, but not so good at the Bandit Ambush, you can create your deck accordingly. However, the dealer is always going to throw in a few distinct challenge cards for each map, and the final fight is always unique. Hand of Fate is unlike anything I've played before, and tries to push out on its own and create a hybrid genre. At this point, it's done a very, very good job, and the devs are just adding more cards, more content, and aiming to make the game bigger and better than it already is. 
Next up is Of Guards and Thieves. Created by Subvert Games, they're a relatively new developer, but this by no means suggests that they're without skill. Of Guards and Thieves is all about delivering a fun, casual, asymmetric combat game with clean mechanics and great diversity. It's all about the experience of playing and aims to get you into matches as quickly as possible, because it's the mechanics that really shine here. This is a much more casual multiplayer experience than what we've looked at prior, and it's something that you could just sit down and play for a couple of hours just to relax. A traditional match is played between two teams with differing goals, all structured around valuable artifacts scattered throughout the maps. The job of the guards is to defend these pieces, while the thieves must steal one artifact in particular. Though the guards don't know which one, so they have to protect them all equally until they're able to work it out. The asymmetric gameplay is key here, as the guards are large and slow, equipped with high-powered rifles and riot gear, and they're best suited towards defensive gameplay, keeping a distance and prevailing with superior firepower. Then again, on the other side of the coin are the thieves. They've got very little health, but they're very fast and they are deadly at close range. Thieves can also see in the dark and move through spaces that the guards can't, such as air vents and windows. Finally, one of the best examples of this back and forth is the idea of darkness, which is featured really heavily in the game design. Thieves can see in the dark thanks to night vision goggles, but the guards only have flashlights to light the way directly in front of them. All of the lights in the map can be turned on or off, and good thieves can very easily lay traps for their opposition. Outside of the ordinary mode, there is also a slew of alternate modes that offer different challenges, from a defensive zombie horde mode to a soccer mode, it's clear that the developers are keeping a close eye on what their players are after in a game. Of Guards and Thieves really does scratch that itch of stealth games like Tenchu or Splinter Cell, while adding a welcome competitive twist to the common stealth formula. The art style is relatively simple, the character designs are easy to distinguish in a pinch. The sound is mechanical for the most part, it's focusing more on effects, though it will be interesting to see how the team introduce music in the future. As a game more geared towards a casual player rather than something hardcore, Of Guards and Thieves is certainly worth a look for something a bit more relaxing and enjoyable to play. This one is for the strategy veterans out there. Planetary Annihilation is from Uber Entertainment, a team formed out of the long list of accomplished designers who worked on games like Total Annihilation, Supreme Commander and Supreme Commander 2. The influences of those games are clear in this new title. However, the thing that sets this new game apart from those titles, and any other strategy game on the market right now, is the map. Each battlefield takes place over a complete solar system, complete with different sized planets, moons, suns, and asteroids. The effect that this has on traditional strategy tactics and ideals is a bit overwhelming at first, and it takes a bit of getting used to. But once you get used to units hitting your base from ground, from air, water, and an orbital layer above the planet, and also invasions from other planets, it makes it hard to go back to an ordinary two-dimensional Zerg rush. Planetary Annihilation is meant to be played on a massive scale. Rather than build just one barracks and crank out one tank at a time, the game urges you to create ten barracks, each producing an endless stream of lead-spewing machines of war. The thing to focus on with this title is that everything is massive. The scale, the planets, the units, even the audio is a huge original orchestral score that sort of builds and builds to support the epic nature of the action. The only slight that I have with Planetary Annihilation is that it has quite a barrier of entry, and micromanaging a battle across four planets can be taxing on your brain. It is, however, a wonder that it isn't more taxing on my PC. But that being said, there's nothing quite like strapping rockets to a moon and riding it into a nearby planet as an impromptu missile. Planetary Annihilation gives you every opportunity to thwart your opponents, and it is great when you do something that they can't see coming. The last game on our list is an old hand at the Early Access page. Prison Architect was one of the first to be released under this banner, but it truly is a beacon to other developers about how Early Access should be done and done right. The guys at Introversion Software release new content every month on the same day, and stay in close contact with players on the forums to learn what features everyone wants next. Prison Architect is an homage to an earlier era of gaming, the days of Bullfrog and Maxis, games like Dungeon Keeper and Sim Ant. It begs the question of what you as the player would do if tasked with creating your own prison. Would you create a right-wing concrete monstrosity where the punishment for complaining is 12 weeks in the hole? Or would you create a walled rehabilitation community where prisoners have their own cabins and more free time than work time? It's all a matter of choice. But the strength of this game truly lies in the simulation. 
the AI behind the prisoners is nothing short of phenomenal. It follows a Sims-style needs system, where they each have needs for food, sleep, sunshine, exercise and all that. But behind this lurks a hidden system, governing their likelihood to steal a screwdriver and try to shank another prisoner, or dig a tunnel beneath the toilet, or even start smuggling illicit goods into the prison. There are ways to monitor these actions, and you can always toss the cells to find contraband. But it really does sometimes feel like trying to herd cats. The prisoners will always find a way around you, and this is great. So, you can set up patrol routes and hire guards to keep everyone in check, but the fog of war system means that you can only see what your guards can, and there are always blind spots. I once had a particularly rough prisoner named Jason Briggs, who was in for murder and assault. Of course Jason took it upon himself to get into every fight possible, and after one particularly bad scrap in the showers, I sent him to solitary for a week. Rather than go in the hole, Jason pulled a shiv and shanked one of my guards. Of course, angry as I was, I sent the remaining guards to deal with this violent individual. However, he managed to mug that first guard. So, armed with a pistol, Jason Briggs violently executed six of my guards and opened all of the cells, essentially crowning himself king of the cell block, before I called the riot guards to take him down. Stories like these seem to write themselves in Prison Architect, and if you're one for management simulators, especially ones with a twist, then Prison Architect is certainly worth a look. Outside the main game, there is also a very active modding community, churning out reskins like this wonderful Star Wars mod called Imperial Architect. It turns your guards into stormtroopers, your cleaners into R2 units, and your medbeds into Bacta tanks. Unfortunately, there isn't a Sarlacc pit to throw the prisoners into, but maybe one day. So there it is, my list of top indie early access games on Steam right now. The list of games that I wanted here was far longer than the few that made it in. If there are any games that you think are great and should have made the list, just leave them in the comment section below and let us know what they are and why. And of course, be sure to subscribe to the Grab it Magazine YouTube channel for more great indie gaming news and content. And of course, check out the app on the App Store now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.